seventh Sunday after Pentecost. The epistle is taken from the first of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, I make known unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast after what manner I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Chaphos, and after that by the eleven. Then he was seen by more than five hundred brethren at once, of whom many remain until this present, and some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen by me as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace in me has not been void. We stand for the gospel. The gospel is taken for that, from that of St. Mark. At that time, Jesus, going out of the coast of Tyre, came by Sidon to the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they brought to him one deaf and dumb, and they besought him that he would lay his hand upon him. And taking him from the multitude apart, he put his fingers into his ears, and spitting, he touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he groaned, and he said to him, Epheta, which is, Be thou opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke right. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal did they publish it, and so much the more did they wonder, saying, He has done all things well. He has made both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Those are the words of the gospel. Please be seated. The announcements, we ask for your prayers for the repose of the soul of Brother Mark's sister, who passed away just this morning after a long battle with cancer. So her name was Gabrielle Schiltz, and please certainly keep her in your prayers. I'm sure Brother Mark and her family would be very grateful. This Sunday, we return to the normal schedule during the school year. The seminarians will return on Saturday for the beginning of our academic year. So starting next Sunday, we'll have the normal mass schedule, that being 720 low mass and a 10 a.m. solemn high mass. And the other masses this week will be at 715 as usual. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. We have this story of our Lord curing the man deaf and dumb, and to do so, he uses a rather strange method. It's really one of the very few times you see him doing something like this in the Gospels, where he takes a little bit of his saliva, and with it, in a very perhaps to our modern sensibilities, in a very unsanitary manner. He puts some of that on the man's tongue, and that is what brings back the man's power of speech. We see him doing something similar in another passage of St. John, where with his saliva he makes a bit of a clay out of the dust of the road, and with that he cures a man who was born blind. And we might ask why our Lord is using these instruments, why he's going about curing a man in this way. The rationalists would try to explain away the miracle by saying that our Lord knew of some obscure medicinal properties of human saliva when mixed with certain minerals. Obviously, we're not going to go down that ridiculous path. But it still doesn't answer the question because our Lord certainly has no need of curing these men in this way. We see him elsewhere in the gospel cure someone from leprosy with a simple word. 
he just says, I will be thou made clean. Or elsewhere we see him raise Lazarus from the dead simply, again, by a word, calling out, Lazarus, come forth. Our Lord even cures people with a simple thought. You have, for example, the woman who was troubled with the issue of blood, and our Lord cured her with a simple thought. He does not need these external instruments, the saliva touching the man, saying these words. Why does he use them then? And we might say that one reason why he does is simply to set a pattern for the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, God acts upon us ordinarily by means of instruments. God, even in nature, usually acts by means of instruments, what we call secondary causes. If he wants a plant to grow, he doesn't himself give it the power. He can do that. But normally he uses the minerals, the rain, the sun, etc. And this is, St. Thomas says, this is only honorable. It shows, let's say, more the power of a monarch if he sends his servants to accomplish his wishes than to do so himself. But we can certainly find in these means that God uses to heal our souls, to touch our souls, we can certainly find even more reason present there. Because that is precisely what God does in the New Testament. He touches our souls, he sanctifies our souls through the medium of the sacraments, through the medium of the church, through the medium of his priests. And all these things, God absolutely does not need. The sacraments are necessary for our salvation only because God wills it to be so. And it's not up to us to choose the path to God that we want. Of course, it doesn't make any sense. I can't say that I'm going to return to God by having my own private relationship with him any more than I can say that I can return to God by sacrificing chickens to him or whatever other animal or by giving away all my money to feed the poor, or by doing great acts of penance. How our souls are healed and sanctified is by the means God chooses, not us. And that only makes sense. And these means that he's chosen are the sacraments, the church, the priesthood. It's through these sensible things that he gives his grace. And we might ask why God chose to do that. St. Thomas will point out two reasons. First, that it is simply in keeping with our human nature. Our human nature, we have a body and a soul. And it's through sensing things, through hearing about them, through seeing them, that our soul learns of them, that our intellect comes to grasp these truths. And so it is with the sacraments. God wants to use these vehicles that are sensible to convey to our souls this grace because of our human nature. We need these sensible things. The sacraments, the rites, the ceremonies of the church, they involve us in healthy corporeal actions. And that simply is in keeping with our human nature. And it also has the added benefit of keeping us away from unhealthy physical actions, ones that lead to sin and to the devil. Good actions are given to us to keep us away from those evil ones. And this is something which is simply in keeping with our human nature. And this is what we need. Protestants would claim to have a purely spiritual worship. In fact, that's really just self-deception. And it hides simply a excuse to get out of doing religious duties. We may try to fool ourselves in that way, but we, can't, we won't be fooled for very long. Before long, our human nature will reassert itself. If we try to say, I, can only, I only need to go to God with my soul and with my thought, That may be true, but it will be true for only a very short time. That our soul needs to be reinforced by those physical activities, which is why God gave us 
these sensible elements in the church, in the sacraments. But a more important reason is because he wants to humble us. Every sin is in some way an act of pride. It's me telling my creator, I want to do things my way, not yours. And so in order to come back to him, in order to repair that, God requires an act of humility. And so God chose something to humiliate us because it is humiliating to have to be dependent on these external material things, to kneel down before we receive communion, or to confess our sins to another sinner like ourselves, another creature like ourselves, but this creature who has certain powers given by God. The rationalists, the Protestants, they don't like this, to be sanctified by material things. They see it as somehow debasing mankind. But this is what God wants. He wants us to have that humility. And that is the way in which we will find that healing and that sanctification for our souls. There's a story in the Old Testament of a Syrian general by the name of Naaman. And this man comes down with the illness of leprosy, an illness which could not be cured. And he is told by one of his servants of a prophet who lives in Judea, who is able to cure such diseases. And so he decides, I'll go there, I'll bring all my wealth, all my riches, and I'll try to pay this man to receive this cure. So he gets this large wagon train and goes to see the prophet, Eliseus. And when he arrives there, the prophet doesn't even come out to say hello or anything else. He sends out a servant to tell him, if you want to be clean, go wash seven times in the river Jordan and you will be cured of your leprosy. And Naaman is furious because of the slight that he thinks that he has received. The prophet wouldn't even come out to talk to him, wouldn't take any of his goods, and just goes, tells him to go and wash in this river. And he says, are not all the rivers of Syria better than the waters of Israel? I'm not going to go wash in this muddy river. It's ridiculous. And so he's furious, and he turns around to go home. And then his servant says to him something which is very wise, he says, Lord, if the prophet told you to go do some really difficult task, to go on some great pilgrimage or whatever, you certainly would have done it. How much more than this little simple thing that he asks of you? And Naaman realizes the wisdom in that. And so he goes to the river, he humbles himself, he washes seven times in the river, and he comes out cured. If he had not taken that plan of God, if he had tried to go about it in his own way, a way which was perhaps much more difficult, much more spectacular, and also much more catering to his own self-image, then he would not have been cured. It was only by taking that one very simple and somewhat humiliating course of action which God laid down for him. It's only in that way that he was cured. And there's a great lesson in this for us. We have to have the, the humility to submit ourselves to God's plan, to believe that this plan will work. We have to have the humility to believe what God tells us, to have faith in these instruments that God uses. Just like Naaman, if we had wanted to be cured or healed or forgiven of our sins in any other way other than the one God has chosen, it won't work, quite simply because it's of our own choosing, not of God's. To believe all these things takes a great deal of faith and a great deal of humility. To believe that in a simple pouring on of a tiny little bit of water washes away all the sins from the soul makes it brighter than the sun, pours the inestimable grace of God into my soul. 
to believe that what looks like a little piece of bread, what tastes like a little morsel of food, is in reality God himself. To believe that this little thing with which I can do whatever I want, because it's completely in our power, to believe that that is in fact the creator of the entire universe. To believe that a few words of a man like me, a sinner like me, can wipe away all the sins from my soul, to believe that this man acts with the power of God himself, that takes a lot of faith, and that takes a lot of humility. And we must have a great deal of faith, a great deal of humility to bow down before that reality. Because, unfortunately, people are very frequently scandalized by this simplicity, by this humiliation which is required in yielding ourselves to these instruments. We can think, for example, of all the problems in the church. This magnificent institution which God has chosen to sanctify our souls. And yet, this magnificent institution which God has chosen still is full of sinners and sometimes very malicious sinners. We can think of all the scandals in the clergy, the child abuse, what have you. Sometimes, even if we don't go that far, let us say we could see certain defects in a priest, impatience, harshness, what you may. Priests are sinners just like you, and we all have our own defects as well, unfortunately, which we have to battle with. And sometimes there can be a great deal of scandal in seeing such things. I have heard many times from people who have lost the faith, who have apostatized, because they were yelled at by a priest, or because they were yelled at by a nun, or perhaps they were somehow involved with some sort of crime committed by a priest. And I don't in any way intend to lessen the gravity of those sins on the part of the priest, not at all, but nonetheless, those who lose the faith because of this will not be exonerated either. They're still held responsible because they should have seen beyond the human weakness, beyond the human misery and even the wickedness, to the priestly character, to the divine element in the church which is present. It takes a lot of faith to see that God can use men who are capable of such horrors to bring his grace to our souls. And we can have a certain reaction in the face of that. The man in the gospel, he had the gift of sight. He could see our Lord taking some of his saliva and going to touch his tongue. And he could have been very much repulsed by that and said, no, that's okay. If this is what it takes to be cured, um, I'm fine. But he doesn't. He had the faith. He had the humility. He didn't tell our Lord how to cure him. He didn't tell him, no, don't do this. There's a better way. There's a much more important way. You can invoke your almighty power with a great thunder and lightning and everything like that. He doesn't tell him. He simply accepts the way that our Lord chose. And it is through this acceptance, through this action that our Lord chose, that the divine power works his cure. And so it is with us. We can come up with a thousand different ways, which we may think are much better ways of sanctifying souls in this world. But they're not the way God chose, and so they can never work. We have to have that faith. We have to have that humility. There's a famous story of a Jewish man who was converting to Catholicism. This was in Germany back during the Renaissance period. This Jewish man was converting to Catholicism. He'd been receiving many classes from a priest, and he was ready to, to receive baptism. And he told the priest, before I, I'm baptized, I first want to go to Rome to visit the seat of Catholicism and to see it there. And the priest 
tried to dissuade him from this course of action because he knew in Rome at this time, the Renaissance time, there was a lot of corruption, even a lot of debauchery among the hierarchy in Rome. And so he thought that this man, he said, surely if he sees all of that, he will say, well, I want nothing to do with this, and he'll never become Catholic. So he tried to dissuade the man from going to Rome, but the man would not be dissuaded. He left, he went to Rome, and the priest thought, well, that's the end of that. I'm never seeing him again. But a few months later, when the man returned to Germany, he went to the priest and he said, okay, I'm back. Now I'm ready to be baptized. And the priest asked, said, I'm very happy to hear that, but I'm just curious. After seeing all that you saw in Rome, how do you still want to be part of the church? How do you still want to be a member of this institution? And the man said, well, you are right. The first thing, my first reaction when I saw all of this corruption was to be shocked. I thought the wool had been pulled over my eyes. I'd been fooled and I wanted nothing to do with this. But then on reflecting for a while, I realized that if God could use an institution which had so much corruption in it to last for thousands of years and to save souls, if God could do that, then this institution must have the power of God within it. Because only a divine power would be capable of taking something so weak and so miserable and still making it capable of bringing such graces to the world. That man had a very great spirit of faith and a very great spirit of humility. And we want the same. We want to have that spirit of faith, even if we see in the church, in this human organization, great misery. We want to have that faith to see that therein nonetheless flows the almighty power of God. And we want to have a great love for this institution and for the sacraments, for all these great graces God has poured upon us, which he has used to give his truth and his grace to us. So let us ask our Blessed Mother for that great faith to believe these truths that our Lord taught, that great humility to submit our own ideas to them, and yes, even a great appreciation and a great love for them because it is by means of them alone that we are able to reach Almighty God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.